Uh, what's up, guys? Uh, podcast number whatever. Uh, we're approaching 400. And for our 400 podcast, we'll do what we've done for every big milestone. Nothing. We won't have a special guest. We won't try to have a special guest. Uh, and we'll just have, a, you know, we'll end up going, well, no time for now. We'll do something good for the 450th. That will be our show. But uh, I'm very excited uh, because uh, who knew we'd get to 400 shows? Uh, as a special uh, as a special gift, Dan will breathe into the microphone in a disgusting way. Terrible. Uh, okay, recently Sour Shoes, who I like, and I've, I've, I've said this a million times before, I've known about Sour Shoes doing an impression of me, Gary, everybody there for years. Sour Shoes was a guy who used to show up at the old uh, studio on 40 West 57th Street, and I'd be walking in uh, the front door. I wasn't allowed on the side door. <laughs> and Sour Shoes would be there some mornings with a uh, hockey stick, sometimes a goalie stick, a <laughs> pair of rollerblades, a first base glove, and a plate of lasagna. He would give me the plate of lasagna all the time. I'd give it to Gary. Gary would throw it out. Can't take stuff from guests. But Sour Shoes sometimes would do impressions of me, of Gary. And I go, I say to Gary, look, this guy on stairs is unbelievable. And we had him on sometimes. But the problem with Sour Shoes is, like a lot of great artists, he's agoraphobe. He's never left his house. <laughs> and he's, I think, approaching 50. And it's kind of sad. So he lives with his mom. And when his mom dies, I don't know what's going to happen. He's going to go what I call the bullshitty route. <laughs> and maybe be put in a home. I'm sure Howard will put him up. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I, I I recently heard that Sour Shoes has been calling around uh, doing me for a while. He did it on Howard for a while, and I had no problem with it. First of all, if he's not on the phone, it's not a good impression. And if he's on the phone, it's only funny if you know it's not me. You know a guy's doing an impression because then it's impressive. But he, he recently fooled Adam. Adam thought it was me for, okay. Four minutes, five minutes, fine. For about 45 minutes, <laughs> Adam thought Sour Shoes was me. Adam Carolla. Adam Carolla. <laughs> and Adam is, Adam's a great guy. He's a funny motherfucker. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy, I perform with him at Caroline's a couple times. He's, he's a great comedic partner. And, uh, but, you know, like all of us, I'm putting myself in this category too. He's so drenched in his own ego. And he had points to make. So he couldn't concentrate on whether it was me or not. <laughs> he had points to make about my situation. Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has a point to make about Artie's situation. So, uh, you know, uh, Adam uh, is an expert on addiction because he did a show with Dr. Drew for 50 years. <laughs> and he uh, he gave his uh, thoughts on that. And then he gave uh, condescending advice to me, but it wasn't me. He was giving <laughs> advice to Sour Shoes, who had no idea what was going on. He couldn't believe someone fell for it for longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> but the insulting thing... And Adam was cool enough to point this out afterwards. The insulting thing was, uh, okay, Adam pointed out that he has my crazy laugh that I do down pat, and it's perfect. It's perfect. As long as he's on the phone. Howard had him in studio once to do it. It was horrible. <laughs> Howard had a fake laugh at it, and he doesn't have the material. And that brings me to my point. Adam was very smart in pointing out that, yeah, the real Artie would not have laughed like that early on. You know, it just seems like a guy doing an over-the-top impression. But the other thing that he kind of alluded to, but it should be the big, big uh, key here that it's not me, is he didn't say something funny for an hour. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the only time he got a laugh is when he repeated verbatim something I had said. <laughs> and then he started saying stuff like uh, certain words were clearly not me. And he was he was like a lot of impressions. He got lazy. <laughs> He's no Fred Travelina. <laughs> so he got lazy, and and but I'm not really that famous of a guy. So those guys around him thought, oh, it could be me. But a lot of them are Stern fans, and they're all trying to be me. And uh, some of them thought, oh, it's, I don't think it's Artie. But they didn't realize why they didn't think so. Some were going, his laugh, his wheeze. He wasn't being funny. <laughs> Watch every appearance I ever made on the Corolla show, including when we did Caroline together. I say something funny every four seconds. <laughs> every four seconds. I get a bigger laugh than's ever been on the show. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't happening. You know why? Because it wasn't me on the phone. It was Sour Shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, the biggest insult to some of these idiots on Twitter when Sour Shoes was on Howard, like they said, oh, it's a, it's a great impression. Well, yeah, it is. But then they go, well, why doesn't Howard have him sit in the chair and just be arty? <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he might sound a little bit like me in person, but he's not funny. 
he's a creep. They just don't get it. They, the people don't have any respect for comedians because they, 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 they see what we do for a living and it looks like fun. It's me having fun. It's, it's a guy at a party having fun. But, uh, what, what's happening is that the, the reason they don't have that job, and I have it, the reason they're in a cubicle in Baltimore, uh, nervous that their boss, that their regional manager is going to look at something they tweeted recently and say, this is offensive. You're fired. You're going to fire me? Yeah. Because I tweeted something offensive. Well, that and mostly because you're insanely expendable. <laughs> <laughs> mostly because anyone could do your job. Your only qualification is sitting in a cubicle. <laughs> Why don't I do what Artie does? I'll just sit in the chair. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But people actually say that. All right. Well, fine. Sit in the chair and see what happens. <laughs> sit in the chair and see if the audience of Howard Stern likes you, <laughs> tolerates you for longer than three seconds. <laughs> And you might say, well, you know, anybody can sit in the chair. They give Beetlejuice a, a show. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's let's bat down that fucking theory. <laughs> That's right, Beetlejuice, Riley Martin had a show. They were being paid four hundred dollars a show. I was getting nine hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> there were multiple times they could have let me go. Like when we went to Sirius, Howard's like, "Can you come? Can you get a train? Yeah, sure." And I got a two hundred thousand dollar year raise. <laughs> And they tolerated me doing stand-up in every city in the country, tripling that money, getting book deals. When John, when Stuttering John tried to get a book deal, uh, Don Buckwell basically almost uh, chopped his head off with a machete in his office. <laughs> and John, oh, I get a book deal. You know, you're, you're a stuttering retard. <laughs> and you're not funny. Someone told you you're funny. Why does he get Because he's funny. Because he comes in every day and he's funny. <laughs> Problem was, I got funnier than Howard. <laughs> Howard noticed that and noticed I was getting attention every day. Every day, there were 4,000 calls about me. <laughs> and, f okay, let's put the funny part aside. Uh, the only person funnier than me in the room, by the way, is Fred. <laughs> Howard's hilarious, but Howard's a marketing genius. Absolute genius. And a genius broadcaster, a genius communicator. He's also very funny. He's not as funny as me, but I'm a junkie. <laughs> Fred is uh, funnier than all of us, but uh, listen, grew up on a farm. <laughs> Amazing man, though. A good man. Benji's very funny, too, but I don't know. Again, eventually, Benji puts on a robe and he stinks. I don't know. <laughs> no. uh, you know, so, uh, you know, you want to get real? Let's get real. So, you know, I, I, eventually uh, people called up and said, uh, I want to talk about Artie. And Howard's like, well, this is getting ridiculous. And why would they want to talk about me? Okay, funny aside. Howard, happily married to a beautiful woman, and they had a wonderful life, a normal, wonderful life. Howard had cashews and boiling water for dinner. Because <laughs> Howard's got that awful metabolism, you know, and I don't blame Howard for eating like that. Howard's got a, a bad, like, you know, like me, got a bad metabolism. He gets fat easy. You see the young picture of Howard, and he's got that awful, like, odd shape. <laughs> uh, very awkward, like his hips get big. Looks like a rosebud. <laughs> and he gets fat in places you shouldn't have fat. He starts to look awful, like really awkward. Like I'm heavy set, but you know, I used to play ball and I look like a guy, you know. And you know, people like Howard and John, they're, they're all getting shape at the gym. And uh, I go, guys, listen, pick an American sport. <laughs> pick an American sport. Let's play stickball. Let's play basketball. If me and Howard played basketball, I'd win 37 or nothing <laughs> if the game was up to 37. Say we play stickball. Say I win the coin toss and I get up first. Howard, you know, would never get up. First of all, he'd never come near the strike zone because he would throw like one of the Olsen twins. And Howard, but here's where Howard's a brilliant marketer and Gary isn't. Howard said to Gary, why did you do it? Exactly. There's Howard's genius. You can't throw. You have to admit your limitations. You got an argument throw. You can't. John Hines said you can. He's at fault here. I would play catch with Gary for a millisecond and said, Gary, get a lawyer. Whatever you have to do, get out of doing this. <laughs> Pick an autistic kid to do it. Say, I'm going to let him do it because let, let him have the thrill. Because he would do it better. An autistic homosexual kid would have thrown it better. And people like Howard and I are assholes for pointing that. Howard's being honest with him. Don't do it. Would Howard ever do it? Of course not. Because he would look like an autistic homosexual kid. <laughs> Howard never does anything where he looks bad. And that's brilliant. 
he, when his, okay, when Private Parts came out, the movie, he was everywhere. And he was almost all the time funny everywhere in his habitat. He was asked, I'm going to say, probably knowing the business, four million times to host Saturday Night Live. Lord, you know, Lord knows who the wind blows. And Howard was the shit at that point. A-list. First guy in the history of radio to become an A-list star. You, you, you anticipated his arrival in an event like Brad Pitt. And he's a radio guy. And no one's ever done that. Did Howard host Saturday Night Live? Trivia. No. <laughs> Why? Because he would have had to do a monologue. And those sketches. It would be on tape of him bombing for 90 minutes. <laughs> what did he do? And he got all the publicity and more for doing it. He sat with someone we thought was brilliant, Norm MacDonald, and he was right, and bashed the show with Norm. <laughs> what he, he basically did what he does on the radio. Bashed the show. Doesn't really kill, but gets that nervous applause. And everybody's talking about it. He gets more publicity, and he looks fine. He's not bombing anywhere. Why hasn't Howard ever been roasted somewhere? Because he'd have to get up at the end and do a monologue. And he'd probably bomb. He's not good at that. He's not a stand-up. He is a genius radio guy. He never leaves that habitat. If you want to interview Howard, you come to him. And people do. And that's why he's a badass. So, you know, th th this is what we got going on here. You got to be smart about shit. I do everything. And I'm not great at everything. But I'm good enough to where I probably won't look stupid. Now, this tape of me looking stupid, too. <laughs> but I've done every type of roast. I've been roasting on Howard. I do roasts. And uh, every time I did a big Comedy Central roast, I always do uh, very well. I've done stand-up specials. I was a sketch comedian for two years on Mad TV doing sketches. Almost every one of them was good. <laughs> I, uh, I was on the radio. As a sidekick, as a host, I'm hosting a podcast right now. What do you got? I'll do it. And if I promote something, I'll do everything. Okay? So don't bitch at me. <laughs> I'm bringing it. No one was ever stupid enough because of my record to let me throw out a first pitch in a major league game. <laughs> like, we asked the Yankees when I was at Stern. They go, no. <laughs> we just Googled already. <laughs> Where did they let me do it? At the Newark Bears. So after I annihilated Gary, after I annihilated him on the air, everybody was waiting for me to do it. Look, we asked the Yankees. They said no. The only place they let me do it was the Newark Bears. But let me tell you something. After I annihilated Gary, there's still pressure. It ain't pressure like doing it at your favorite major league. No. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Gary has a point. There's more pressure. But still, after what I put Gary through, there was pressure. <laughs> and I, uh, I did it twice. At Bears, uh, at Newark Bears, and I was all that pressure. It's uh, it's hard to do. By the way, I threw a strike first, <laughs> both times. <laughs> I look at a guy who's played ball. I threw a strike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Artie. I'm your friend, Artie. I'm not bullshit, guys. <laughs> I'm not a genius like Howard is. He points that out. He also points out that you people aren't geniuses. <laughs> but you're smart enough to make enough money to afford 12 bucks a month, aren't you? <laughs> over at Sirius. Not coming over to me is the biggest scam ever. Come here. I'm funnier. I do shit. And the reason people called all the time was not because I was funnier. For some, maybe. Was because I was a junkie road comedian going to St. Louis and getting arrested almost every weekend. <laughs> Who are they going to call about? Ozzy and Harriet <laughs> eating sensibly and fostering cats or the fat junkie who's fucking getting arrested on stage in fucking Milwaukee. <laughs> Sounds like Artie was taking over the show, buddy. And then they made the awful mistake of having a popularity contest. <laughs> I remember this. Let's go over this. At K-Rock, <laughs> they, saw, they thought it'd be funny. I think it was Casey Armstrong's idea because Howard loves awkward humor. This was funny. They said, we're going to have a contest on the internet. We're going to have people vote on who their <laughs> favorite person is on the show. But, of course, we're not going to waste time. <laughs> Howard's not in it, because clearly he'd win. <laughs> Everyone else, though, is. All right. I won in a landslide. <laughs> I got, I think, 58% of the vote. Robin, I think, got 10. 
I think Fred got four. Biggest crime ever. <laughs> Gary was one, and the rest were not measurable. <laughs> I don't think John was measurable. <laughs> this was John's argument. I'm in the chair. <laughs> what, John? Tonight, Joe, you had to write a book. <laughs> what, John? Well, you don't have to be funny. My bike's on all the time. You had to get you buy me lunch. <laughs> I got no money. I got to shit my pants for the diapers. <laughs> I got to get 10 grand. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. <laughs> all right, so that was funny. How it announced those things, it was funny. Robin seemed a little annoyed. <laughs> I, you know, brushed it off like, well, you know, I'm the fat guy and people like the fat guy. <laughs> I had a lie. Okay. Now we're serious about three years later. And someone says, why don't we do that again? But let's, 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 uh, it was such a landslide. Let's see how, how badly you'd beat Artie. <laughs> 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 so uh, let's have another. Who's favorite? favorite? I, uh, uh, but this time Howard was in it. I won in a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got 44%. <laughs> Howard got 20. The rest weren't measurable. <laughs> <laughs> so now Howard gets a little perturbed. We're laughing it off like it's nothing. But he gave it a little. So now I'm like, guys, thanks for the favor. I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> Howard's excuse basically was, well, listen, of course you guys like Artie. He's like you. <laughs> I'm a genius. <laughs> Artie's not. Neither are you guys. Artie's a fuck up. He's a loser. He's flawed. Who do you relate to? The fuck up. Can you relate to a genius? No. You're a fan of the genius, but you're not a genius. That's basically what his argument was. And I wanted to keep my job. So I said, you're right. Let's roll with that. That's why they like me. Because I'm an idiot. Uh, and that got planted in his head. And then there was a lot of, that, that sort of passive aggressiveness. And then the bro fight happened. And I called him a pelican. Not good. Now look, the guy gave me a job. He did wonders for me. But there's only so long you can fucking put your head up someone's ass if they keep treating you like shit. <laughs> you can't be a sycophant your whole life. You have to be tough. It's the only way you're going to get out of that cubicle, guys. If your boss and hero keeps calling you an asshole <laughs> and you keep taking it, eventually you're going to okay, hey, I, I, thanks for the job, buddy. But I'm not here fucking keeping my mouth shut either. I'm leaving blood on this floor, buddy. <laughs> That I had to tell a story about the cum, cum getting on my chest? <laughs> Did I have to give you seven of the greatest moments in the fucking history of the show? <laughs> no. Did I have to go on the street after uh, 11 a.m. and have UPS drivers on 6 a.m. to go, Did she have a dick, Artie? <laughs> no, I didn't. So I earned my keep. But I think I did. <laughs> And eventually there was tension, and uh, I got mad. He got mad. I was a junkie. I missed shows, and uh, he didn't like me anymore. I liked them, but he started acting like a real dickhead, doing things that were really disgusting to me and others. So when you hear Sour Shoes, fool Adam. Remember, I love Adam, but this is telling. People have no respect for me. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't tell it wasn't me because... But just by the fact that he wasn't saying funny shit, what he was doing was pretending to be a fuck up. And when they called him on shit, when they let him talk too long and he had a chance to be funny, he would go, man, man, <laughs> let's play the piano. <laughs> Finally, Adam wised up and asked him about a story that, uh, I'll tell you what that story is so Sour Shoes knows it in case he calls Adam next. Adam finally said, okay, we got to prove it. Then they fell for it after a half an hour. <laughs> they figured it out. He said, Sour, uh, me, you, and uh, uh, Artie, Artie, me, you, and... Uh, Jimmy Kimmel were going to have a deal at William Morris uh, years ago. Well, give me the details of that. Here are the details. Here's where I met Adam and Jimmy. I, uh, after I did the two years on Mad TV, I had this great tape of all these sketches that you get if you're on a sketch comedy show uh, for a couple of years because you do all these characters. I then went, after I was asked to leave politely, I went to uh, <laughs> uh, the first movie audition I got was Dirty Work. I met Norm on the set of that. It's a buddy comedy and Don Rickles, Farley, Sandler, Jack Warden's our dad. And of course, the Rickles story, like you're, you know, uh, it was a big deal. So we shot that. People thought it went good. It didn't come out and not do well yet. So I had that window of time with the tape, Mad TV. I said no to a couple of TV shows because I was shooting a movie. I had another movie offer from Lost and Found with David Spade. I had juice in the TV world. They love when you say no to them because you're doing something better. And I was. Also, they, so they see the tape of me doing all the sketches. They hear I'm in Dirty Work. It's supposed to come out. It's the hottest thing. Norman's the hottest thing on SNL. 
and in a room, man, just fucking get out of my way. So I had a triple threat going on about. I had a. There were four networks at the time. By the time we took meetings for two weeks in the fall of '97, UPN, CBS, ABC, NBC, and the WB, bringing up the rear, <laughs> all made offers. Four way fucking uh, frenzy here. And uh, James Baby Doll Dixon in New York and the great Jennifer Craig in L.A. for uh, for. Uh, for uh, William Morris, who are my agents. I'll never forget, I was sitting in the James Dixon's office. It was me, James, Mike August, and Mike August's teeth. <laughs> he had a, Mike had a golf club, hard at work. And uh, Peter, uh, Peter, I think his name was Tor, Peter Roth, was the head of Fox at the time. And uh, the offer was $650,000 for the deal. James said, he put, he put Peter Roth on the mute. He looks at me with a marble red, and he goes, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell him a million bucks, a million bucks and take him off the market right now. We'll do the deal right now, if that's okay with you. We're going to go back and forth. He's going to land at about 750 grand, and that'll be a deal. Good with you? I said, fine. He took it off mute. He said, million bucks, Pete, and you got it right now. He won't call anybody else. <laughs> Peter does. give me five minutes. Call back, said 750. Deal. <laughs> That's why James Baby Don Dixon is able to send obnoxious Christmas cards over here. <laughs> I love Dixon. I love him. And I love Jennifer, and uh, I even love Mike. <laughs> His teeth are questionable. <laughs> but uh, look, they did right by me. Jennifer, all those guys, they, they made me a wealthy man. This was after two years of Mad TV salary. This was after Dirty Work and the Spain movie and uh, royalties some commercial work, voiceover work, stand up on the road. And uh, the first check for that seven hundred fifty thousand dollars deal was two fifty. William Morris got the check the next day. They took twenty five grand out. And they sent me a check. I said, "I'm putting that in the bank. I'm not telling my mom." And I started a corporation called Too Fat to Fish Inc. <laughs> my mother screamed that at me when I was trying to go fishing five years earlier. She didn't know she named the corporation. I got the balance of two hundred twenty five grand, and I showed it to my mom with the checks with Too Fat to Fish on top. <laughs> And that is what's known as one of the better moments of my life. <laughs> and my mom, too. So I had that deal. So now you have a deal like that. They say, hey, we're going to interview people to run your show, showrunners. And uh, like what Norman Lear did for, you know, say, all the family. Like they run the show. Larry David and Seinfeld, he ran the show. So you need that guy, that writer. So I taught uh, everybody in town because of the uh, enormity of the deal was taking uh, meetings with me. Everybody, William Morris writers. So one day, Dixon goes, I rep these guys. They're a team on the radio and they're a writing team. It's Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla. And they're younger. They're very funny. And uh, they kind of know who you are and they would want to work with you. I said, really? So I was in L.A. at the time. They said, we're going to go to the Beverly Hills office of William Marshall. We'll get the whole conference room. It's be you, Jimmy, Adam, and me, and Jennifer. So it's, it's Dixon, Jennifer, me, and a young Kimmel and Carolla. And a young Lang. And I meet them. It goes great. We're making each other laugh. I remember Adam in particular was very funny in the meeting. Very funny. He was talking about how he hates people. <laughs> like comedy is not a matter of opinion. Sometimes it's just a fact. He goes like, like say someone tells you, this is what Adam said. He goes, say someone tells you Murphy Brown is funnier than The Simpsons. You go, well, no, it's not. And they say, well, it's a matter of opinion. You go, well, no, no, not the same. <laughs> I promise you, if you could build a machine where you put something in and it tells you what's funnier, if you put Murphy Brown and The Simpsons in, it would come out Simpsons every time. <laughs> and he made me, he was very funny in that. And I love Jimmy, of course. Jimmy was affable and funny and great. Picture Kimmel now, 30 pounds heavier. That's a likable guy. <laughs> now, they're both awesome guys, obviously, and, and hilarious. And, uh, you know, but here's where agents bullshit you. I said, okay, I want those guys. I picked them. I suppose he was my choice. I want them to run my show. The agents go, oh, no, they're not ready for that yet. I go, why'd I meet them? Well, maybe they could be writers. I go, well, isn't that down the road? <laughs> And uh, I, I, quite frankly, I guess James said Artie loved you, and uh, you could probably be the runners of the show. But uh, we got to—I go. don't know if you're ready for that yet. But Artie wants you to be the runners. Jimmy, not kidding, literally thought it meant to get coffee, like running. <laughs> you imagine? That's—I was bigger than them in the business, <laughs> but they skyrocket past me. <laughs> Jimmy's, Jimmy's in his twentieth year. As the Johnny Carson of ABC, I'm in a living room with Dan Filato doing a podcast right. <laughs> And Adam has millions of dollars. 
It's not his third boxing movie. <laughs> That's the story. That's the details. We didn't talk again until three years later, and we repeated the story in a very funny way on the Howard Stern show when we were both, we were all like sitting in that chair, and those were fun, fun times. I love Adam. I love Jimmy. I'm busting balls around. They're, they're great, great people, great friends. And that, those were the details. Uh, Sour Shoes didn't know that. <laughs> so he started playing the piano again. And he got found out. So it's interesting. That's my take on it. I love Adam, but uh, you got to give sour credit. The fool guy like Adam who knows me well, uh, he got him. But 30 minutes, Jesus. You might think I say something witty. <laughs> so this is an intro to that, and we're going to play now in its entirety for my podcast listeners that entire Sour Shoes Corolla thing. It's about 31 minutes. And uh, for your listening pleasure, I love you, Adam. Enjoy. And uh, I love you, Sour Shoes. Take care, brush your hair, and listen up. Bye. Artie Lang is on line one. Artie? Artie Lang, line one. Hey, Ed. Hey, Artie. What's going on? No, you just were talking about uh, home improvement. I remember I was sheetrock in a bathroom in uh, Newark. I spent like nine days in a bathroom with like a meatball wedge and uh, a, a, bottle of, a bottle of Jack Daniels and... Uh, that was the last of uh, the foreman uh, watching me do a sheet rocking <laughs> job. <laughs> so what's up? It's like a postcard. <laughs> hey, Artie, how are you feeling? I heard in the news that there was some uh, brush with the law. Well, yeah, you know, the, the, the Hoboken cops, were, the guys were great. Uh, they couldn't have been better. You know, listen, I fucked up. And uh, it's, you know, it, I had, a, I had a setback, and these guys were great. They couldn't have been, you know, it wasn't like a sting operation. I mean, it wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't like Goodfellas or, uh, you know, uh, like Ray Liotta running down to trying to get to the airport and, and get his sauce going on the left burner of the stove or anything. The guys were real cooperative with me, you know, and uh, I showed them what I had, and, uh, you know, they brought me down to the station, and, uh, you know, and I got everything squared away with my lawyer, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, if it fucks things up with Judd, what he's done for me and Pete Holmes were crashing, I understand, you know. Why do you think, going. why do you think it would? Uh, by the way, uh, cra I love crashing and, uh, thanks. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Uh, the reason I, I love it and I, I, so far already in the first two episodes and they're on episode, I guess five is coming up, but uh, where are, where are six or what are you holding up, Gary? Six is coming up. Six is coming up. Five. I just saw six yeah. is coming up. Are you going to, yeah. are you coming back? As of right now I am, but you know, I understand I, I tweeted out on Friday you know, I can fully understand if uh, HBO, if there's a problem with what with what went down last weekend, I understand. As of now, everything's set, and uh, we, you know, we couldn't gotten more rave reviews. I mean, everybody that's see, that's seen it is, is is just they're awestruck and they're bragging about it. You know, and it is nine episodes this year, and then you know we we're all set to go for for, for next season. But uh, I just wanted to make it clear that I I totally understand if if they've got a problem with me being part of the show. I'm just grateful that I was able to judge that faith in me and Pete to you know to be part of this first season, which I couldn't have been more happy with. Well, it's a couple things, and then we'll uh, we'll steer it back your way. Um, first off, there are no nicer guys. Forget about comedy just on the planet than Pete Holmes and Judd Apatow. They're the two right. nicest. They're just the friendliest guys, especially <laughs> when you look at who you have to, all the douchebags you have to deal with in comedy. Oh, God, for them, forget about it. They're, it uh, they're, they're, they're nice for florists. Forget about comedians. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good, number one. Number two, uh, the show, I, Artie, I don't know if you feel the same way I feel, but I'm like, I see a lot of these shows like Girls and a lot of other ones and they start off funny and then at some point they get so caught up in a political statement that they've ceased, you know, they become the, you know, it's like season eight of MASH and it's Alan Alda standing there with pork chop sideburns going, I don't care if he's the enemy, he's a human being and I'm going to perform surgery on him. And it's like, where's the, what happened to the jokes? When they're jokes? Yeah, you know, I was... 
you know, it's so funny you said that. And then they had B. And I remember when BJ Honeycutt and him actually hug? And yes. And they're crying. And that, <laughs> right. You talk about dumb the water shark. down and dumb yes. down. Yeah. yeah right. So I, I, like, I get it. Shows want to evolve, but I'd like mm-hmm. to laugh. And I'm watching. Uh, crashing, and I'm I'm laughing the whole. And I if, look if I want to, you know, I'll listen to some AM talk radio if I really want to think about the political issues of the day. But if I want to yeah, laugh, yeah. I'll if tune I want to hear Don, I, if I want to sleep through Don Imus, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, Artie, let's let's uh, let's let's steer it back toward you for a second. I was talking to our our mutual friend Mike August uh, the other day. Yeah. And we were worried. We we worried about you because uh, we have affection for you, and we think of you as such a unique talent. But we wonder with the drugs and and relapse, and you know the past. What what's going on? Where are you at now? And should we be worried or not? Uh, listen, it's in my. It, 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 it's it's you know I I I I, I I've got. So much to be thankful for right now, and so much to live for, and uh, it, it's not one. It's the, it wasn't to go out and to. It wasn't the incident in two thousand and nine. Let me just clear that clear that up right now. It was nothing. It was not even. It was me just you know having you know it was me going out and these demons that I got to deal with every day. Uh, and it's it's uh, it's not a twelve step program that I need or anything like that. It's these you know I I, I fall into the trap every now and then. Uh, it's not a vicious cycle that's going to get out of hand. Uh, you alluded to girls. Uh, what's that? The broad's name? Uh, Lena Dunham. Dunham. Yeah. You said you brought Mash in, and the, the, I don't know if Major Winchester or her. I don't know. I'd flip a coin uh, on a, with a with a bottle of Jack and Coke. <laughs> I don't know who I'd who I'd pick, but uh, no, we're doing. You know, I'm taking it. I'm taking it slowly right now. You know, I I got two more dates. I'm going to be doing Montclair, the Wellmont Theater, coming up this weekend, and then Red Bank, New Jersey, in two weeks. Uh, in fact, I I spoke with Mike August not too long ago. Told him about that. I got a lot of dates lined up. I've only canceled one show in the last three months, two shows in the last nine months. So, all right, but Artie is is uh, is somebody who sat next to Doctor Drew for over a decade. Yeah, sometimes (laughs) I can hear his voice, uh, and and you know his you know his his diagnosis of you would be get off the road, take time. He'd probably tell you to check yourself into some place. Yeah. Don't you feel I've been on the road and I'm I'm not an addict, but I will tell you this. When you go on the road, you think it's a good idea at 7:22 a.m. or wherever time it is with your clock to have a whiskey and a cigarette in your underpants in the bathroom so you don't get busted <laughs> because it smells like smoke. And I just mean, I'm not an addict. And I'll find myself smoking a cigarette and drinking a whiskey at 7.15 yeah, in the morning. Him, that's yeah. like what the road does. Yeah. Also, you know, having, uh, you know, brisket sandwiched in between a couple of uh, pieces of French toast also sounds like a good idea at 2 a.m. Like it's kind of a killer. Like it, it, it is not about push-ups and eating kale. It's about like the wrong people and the wrong time. So what about that, Artie? I mean, don't you feel like it's so hard? I mean, it was in obviously the the first or I think second episode of Crashing was right. that. Right. Is it? Uh, well, you know, I, I listen. And funny you said the brisket. My mom made made me a tray of meatballs. Yes, on Sunday I got two ovens now in my in my in my house. That's what you need, Artie—a second oven. Yeah, I yeah, two ovens, one another oven for cook sausage and peppers and, and a tray of meatballs just to just to like push the the heroin and coke out of me. But no, but I understand what you're saying. I listen. That was the problem with Howard doing with, with that's where it got to doing stuff on the road. You remember me in Vegas? You sat next to me on the Howard Stern show. Uh, a couple times, and we talked off the air, and that's what the show, that's what it was, I was evolving into doing weekend gigs and doing the show Monday through Friday, and 
it got it got it got out of control, and that was where Howard began. He didn't. He that's where he drew the line. When that incident happened with me in 2009, in December, in January 2010, I, we tried rehab with me the year before. It, I lasted three days in Miami. <laughs> I ordered pancakes in the morning <laughs> as I'm called to talk to Howard to tell him how my rehab's going. And Gary, of course, caught a lot of shit for that. But listen, that's where Howard drew the line. He and he and he told me so many times, "Get off the road. You don't need to do that." You're doing fine, and he's right. I was making nine hundred grand uh, a year alone, just being on the show, the greatest show in radio history. Well, now, I, I think I, I think what people, what a lot of people don't get about Howard is he's a pro. Yeah. And what he was saying to you is, as a professional, here's how you do it, and it is about sort of not jumping on the short money sometimes. And and for guys like us who maybe come from what we come from, if someone wants to pay you, you know, 25, 50 grand to just right. go, just get on a short flight for the weekend. Right. When you come from where we come from, it's hard enticing. to say no yeah. to like, you just go, oh yeah, just give me that. And especially because they set it up three months in advance. You know, I'm doing it, exactly. We're, we just come off interview. Now, he, he did the greatest interview with Paul McCartney. The greatest yes. interview of anyone that's ever interviewed one of the Beatles. I agree. And there I am, five to four days later, I'm in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. <laughs> right. <laughs> For, you know, I like the temptation, you, I can't say no. And that's that was his point. Art, you got to say no. You got to you gotta just, hey, listen, can't do it this weekend. Can I do it once a month? Maybe. That was the problem. I grew, you know, working on the docks when I went out to L.A. and started on Mad TV. I couldn't believe someone would throw bread at me to have me do stand-up on the weekends. That mentality has never left me. I get an opportunity, I run to it. And not, and, and not like I need it for financial gain. I don't. I, you know, I, they were so, Howard was so generous with me through the show. Now, I can't get in touch with them. That's a whole other story, as well as a bunch of other people can't. Uh, and that's well, what, part of... What, is that, right? what does that mean? I, I don't understand. The show obviously has changed there. Things have changed, which I understand. Listen, by all rights, I understand the direction they want to go. He wants to go in over there, booking guests, getting guests, and being more guest-driven being big time big a celebrity guest driven but when it comes to a point that i can't even get him on the phone and i'm hearing that there's a a uh, someone working there that's that's running the ship now that i have no idea who this person is and i can't reach him and guys that have been with him for 20 years can't can't reach him it's a little bit it's a little bit disconcerting you know well i do you, you mean reach personally or reach to get on the air and, and plug both. a date both i don't listen i understand that sirius has a great relationship with hbo i couldn't even get on the sh we couldn't even get in there to plug to, to do a little plug for crashing uh, it, which which is shocking now i don't know if judge tried to go that avenue i'm sure he did he didn't talk to me about it but the fact that we were up at sirius weeks before when they just happen to be on vacation is a little coincidental, don't you think? Well, you know, I've been in radio a long time and right. I know it's it's there's a lot of <clears throat> there's a lot of politics and it's and it is kind of interesting. It, it well it's uh you know, I'll digress a second here, but I remember when I was training uh, Jimmy Kimmel for the for boxing match in 1994, that's how I got <laughs> on to Kevin and Bean. And he, he said, I said, I'd love a shot at the radio. And he said, you know, what do you do and whatever. And he said, just call in on like Tuesday morning as, as your character. And I said, fine. And he said, now, if it doesn't go well, like if they don't like you, you yeah. will never get another shot ever again on Kevin and Bean. And I was like, well, what if I have a little off day? I'm still a funny guy. Like I could bring it next week. And he's like, no. The, you'll never be back, and I just yeah, thought, like you, you could wow. you could call in a week later as Lamont Sanford or something. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I want to meet you. I want to. Uh, here's my friend Rollo, yeah. um, <laughs> or the Puerto Rican guy. But the the, the point is, is right. radio has a very we are now done with this chapter 
turn the page kind of thing. And yeah. it's not like TV, which is weird, which is TV. You can fuck up over here and get another shot over there. Eventually, you get out. But I don't know what Howard's mindset is on this one. And I... Well... Yes. But I, no, I do you wanted, think I, he's angry at you? I Listen, I, I, I don't think he's angry. I think he's scared. I think he truly, uh, he's got a big heart, especially what, what I put him through in those final years on the show. And he, listen, he was I, he was scared, and I don't blame him for being scared. I put him, I really put him in the most, in, in such a fucked position that I don't blame him for acting. Now, this is touching. Now, Robin went in for a surgery two, two years later. And this is the last time I've been with them, right? So I go to visit her. So hold on what, real quick. You say he's scared. He was scared. He was scared for you, for your life, for your safety? I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also, I think he felt kind of helpless, too, you know? Yeah. It was a, yeah, the position, you know, Howard, you know, he could be, he could be passive, get, get to the rap that he's passive-aggressive. But, you know, listen, who wouldn't be in that position, you know? But now I'm hearing there's a people that call in that say that I'm bad mouth, not saying he's no talent. That's not what I've I've said. I said he's the most incredible talent, not just in radio but in entertainment. And for the life of me, I just couldn't figure out why I can't, I can't, and guys that have been with him for 20 years can't reach him. I've never questioned his talent. The guy, all I've said is he's become now this a different. A different person in the sense that it's celebrity with him now. It's getting that big interview, which I can understand. Like you just mentioned, the show evolves, right? And well, that's yeah, I mean, you don't want to hang out with, uh, you know, Gary the Retard your entire career. <laughs> you, if you can, if you can do, yeah, yeah, right. if you can do one of the best or the best Paul McCartney interview ever, long form, and that's yeah. basically going to go in the Smithsonian one day, right. then that's your legacy. And I, you know, and I, I speak, you know, maybe this is some of my personal feelings coming through here as it applies to myself. But, I, you know, Howard's a little older than we are. I think he feels like he's not going to be doing this for another 25 years. Right. He wants to cement his legacy and, I, and, right. and his legacy or a big part of his legacy and, and, and captured forever in digital form is going to be those kinds of interviews. When, you know, uh, uh, 500 years from now, and I'm not exaggerating, if ISIS doesn't win, and, <laughs> because looking now, like maybe they might, but 500 years from now, when a kid goes to do a book report on the Beatles and he wants to research Paul McCartney, he'll have to listen to that Howard Stern interview. Exactly. And I he's think that's, gonna, he, that's part of what Howard's thinking. Yeah, he's not going to go back and look at uh, Bob Levy putting blue cheese dressing <laughs> on, uh, on, uh, on uh, Candace. <laughs> yeah. So, Artie, right. do you take it, like, super personally at a level? You know. It sounds like I'm, you do when a I'm, little bit. When I'm, when I'm doing a podcast, and I want to have podcasts, and I had Gilbert on with me, and Gilbert does his who is Chelsea Handler? What the? Who? They don't, you know, you know they, they, they don't talk to comedians. They won't, they won't book comedians anymore. You know, Gary, he called, he called Gary. And Gary said, listen, we, we don't do, we don't do, we don't do comedians. We, we, that's it on the news anymore. And then, and then you find out they have Chelsea, Chelsea Handler on. And then I told Gilbert, she's not really a comedian. Uh, I don't know one thing she said funny. Uh, do I, do I, do I a little exaggerate? Yeah, my my little bitter, of course. Hey, Artie. Artie? Um, Artie? Yeah. I got a question for you. Go ahead. Um, there was a story where uh, we saw each other and we're going to work together at William Morris many years ago. Right. Can you tell me some details of that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. too. I'm thinking well, too, Adam. Yeah, it you're mad, on it. Adam got it. Was it was Mad TV. It was uh, I was on Mad TV because I just told the pig <laughs> costume story with Norm, uh, and I remembered as well because uh, I think we we met with. I told you about the audition I did with Saturday Night Live, and uh, when Lord Michaels was setting me up the whole time, and I met with Kevin Nealon, and I think I met with you, 
at uh, Joffrey's in Malibu. Is that right? We uh, we had uh, some gabagol. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's sour <laughs> shoes. <laughs> but that was a good. Let me tell you why sour shoes. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Let me tell you why that was a great arty because you you basically just stayed in it the whole time. There wasn't any like you were, you know, right? You were, right. He didn't like he didn't like swing into other people like try to do. This waited like, till the end. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't think it was real arty at the beginning. I was about to ask that at the beginning, but then you just started answering. That's because I love Artie so much, and I and I want to, I want to see everything go good for him. So I'm just answering in the way that I think is inside him that he can't come out and say and do what he, I know he wants. He but would like most, to see yeah. See, most people when they call in and they go, "This is Mike Tyson," then they quickly tell a Tyson esque sort of. I punched him as equilibrium or something. You go, okay, that's yeah, not Mike Tyson. Tell, yeah, it's not right, Mike Tyson because Mike Tyson doesn't sound that much like Mike Tyson. But, right. this is, but you didn't give you didn't give comical answers like you gave truthful you answers. You were straight. Yeah, I like that. It was good. And you know what did you know what sour shoes? What the only thing that stepped on it right at the beginning was the arty laugh to <laughs> that one. The real arty. <laughs> Doesn't do that that early that that often, but then you went right back into like dates and like talking about sobriety and the road, and it, that was good. That was good. Well, well and uh, and also, I, what, what I love what Artie does is <laughs> if he met if he brings up the docs and brings up his work ethic, what always will be there is some kind of uh, weird. And you you had a few of them too in the beginning. There was a few weird uh, references to. Either early, early television, or or either a rock and roll band, usually the Who or Pink Floyd or the Beatles, <laughs> and then it'll always throw in either some kind of a food and like a real obscure, uh, either actor from either Goodfellas or or Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah, and well, he, you know, he got the he, he'll he'll get the whole Balkan thing in there. But that was good. See, first, the only thing that made me a little nervous, so I had this story that, uh, geez, I shouldn't share it with you because next time you you call, there's a story (laughs) about uh, Artie and me and Jimmy uh, collaborating on some project a a million years ago that I, that was my, I'm going to bring this up and see if this is the real Artie. Because when you did the laugh and the whole Bulkin thing, I was like, oh, this is not yeah, Artie. I, I felt but it then too. you just got right into serious sobriety talk. And I was it, almost tempted at that point when you said a million years, because Jackie always uses, you know, a million years ago, he always, he always said, <laughs> <laughs> it was about a million years ago, and it's because he's a great guy. So we did a show, he's always had rascals, we did a show <laughs> at, about a million years ago, and that was when I first told the joke about what do you call a queer Irishman? A Gaelic. <laughs> I was almost tempted to go into that as Jackie. Hey, Sarah Shoes, can you do I I always hear you just doing stern people, but you do I don't know, Jimmy Kimmel? Do you do other folks? Stand back. Thank you, Roz Ambers. <laughs> What already? What? What's with Gilbert? That's, that was Jimmy Kimmel doing Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> oh, okay. That was Jimmy doing Gilbert. All right, Sour what? Shoes. You good? Are we? That we was have, good. Hey, Gary, do we, have any more, do we have anything else to say? <laughs> I do love Gary. <laughs> Gary's right. the best. That's great. I know. I, I, just, I, I wanted to come here because, you know, I, it's, fa- it's funny. There's just real behind, behind the scenes stuff. Sour Shoes actually would call Jimmy Kimmel his Artie. Right, wait, right after the Man Show. This was probably when Jimmy was just starting on ABC in 2003, <laughs> and he would sing Artie singing uh, Arthur's theme from Arthur mm-hmm. and different things like that, talking about food and girls and stuff. It was it was always kind of cute, but then it got to a point where Sour Shoes was doing so much that Jimmy had to get me involved and say, "Listen, it's all, it's fun, it's all fun and games." But after the ninth, you know, phone call, you know. It, it, it could be a little bit, you know, it could be a little, you know, demanding. And I can't be bouncing back, taking phone calls when I'm trying to put my show together. And this was when Jimmy just first started at ABC Channel 7. Yeah. So. Hey, hey, Gary. Go ahead. Can you put Artie on singing the theme from Arthur? 
what is the uh, oh yeah let me do better than that. let me get the grab the let me go to the piano here <laughs> all right um Oh, my God, that looks shit. Oh, wow. I, I always felt like Arthur, especially when he got that hot chick. What was her name? Uh, Le- <laughs> Eliza Minnelli? Eliza. Yeah, I loved, I loved her, especially in New York, New York. Once in your life, you can find her. <laughs> Someone who takes your heart away, and next thing you know, <laughs> you're closing down the town. <laughs> Wake up with gobble and it's a jack and coke. <laughs> then you grab the put Richie's uptown pizza. Then I put I used to gamble. I put down twenty G's on the uh, on the Giants winning out in San Francisco. If you get caught between the moon and New York City, I, I said I hey, Sour Shoes, with, do you live yeah, in an apartment? Because I, I feel like if you you have some downstairs neighbors that are always pissed. Ooh. No, we're all the same house. Our whole family is here. Oh, boy. Hey, awesome. hey, Gary, how much are those speakers you pedal? Uh, the, the new subwoofers they're yeah. from Iowa. All oh, the new sub. They're $999. Nine, 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 nine nine <laughs> they sound. Did you ever hear my pieces of vinyl collection? <laughs> yeah. I got my, my top nine pieces of vinyl right now are going <laughs> to have to be, of course, Steely Dan Asia. <laughs> Up on the hill. My number two pieces of viral right now. I, I, I love to always make lists. Number my second is Ninth Avenue Freeze Out by Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> Ninth Avenue Freeze Out. <clears throat> and then quickly at number nine is obviously ninety nine Luft Balloons. Ninety nine Luft Balloons. Ninety nine pieces of vinyl fly by. <laughs> uh, sour shoes. This is awesome stuff. Unfortunately. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're trying. Oh my God! To... Thank you. Uh, we're... Hello, Lupe. You have a baby net. What's that? Hello. Song? Hello. It's Lupe. Hi, mommy. Hola. Hey, Hola. Hey. Oh, this is uh, what's her name? Lupe. Hello. Hey, baby net. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hey, baby. She's a hot little porn star she spinner. Is. Real quick story. Oh, how we yeah. found her. Real quick story. So how God we found, we always we always get a lot of people say how did you how did you find these whack packers? You know. <laughs> The, the funny thing about her was we found her, and she'd come in, and we were doing this uh, Butterface contest, and she obviously doesn't have a Butterface. So we had a couple porn stars that were going to be judges, and that's how we met her. I think, hey, Sal, did we meet her? Gary, this was a girl that we wanted to piss all over. Remember, she didn't mind if you pissed all over. My cock is gone! Oh, easy, Sal. That was just Sal getting involved. Hey, Sour. Uh... This has been fun. Unfortunately, we I got to do do a little George we're, Takai. We're doing oh, no, 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 George Takai. Yeah, <laughs> You'll never find. Dun, dun, I always picture George Takai with the Bizarre singing uh, well, That's Blue Wall. Yeah. You know. Hey, Sour. Let me give you a George Takai tip. All right, and and yes. this this will work every single time if you want if you want to really sell George. All right. <laughs> I'll tell you what, when I say uh, Japanese internment camp, you correct me and say Japanese American internment camp. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? So I'll say it, right. I'll go, hey, you know, back in the 40s, I I admit it was wrong what this government did when we rounded up the Japanese, you know, with the Japanese internment camps. Oh, no, the Japanese American camp. (laughs) Yeah, but then don't laugh. (laughs) Japanese American internment camp would be a little bit indignant about it. Japanese American internment camp. (laughs) (laughs) You'll never find. (laughs) Thanks, Sour Shows. All right. You cannot say Japanese internment camp in front of George Takei. It's Japanese American internment camp. That's what made it bad. Whew, that was fun. Does anyone else feel high? I am. I've never been more confused in my entire it's life. It's crazy. Oh, he's amazing. <laughs> His already was spot on. The laugh was a little much, a little early, and I was about to go hoop with my William Moore story that only Artie and me and Jimmy knows. Although Artie may have forgotten. It. Who knows if he flushed it out of his system? But then he just went right back to serious talk about like life on the road. I got to give credit where credit's due. Gary over here, our Gary, he's like, 
really concentrating. It's like, I don't think this is already. Well, I wrote that. Yeah, it totally is. is. Gary, I I looked at you a couple of times, and you had a look, but you never really. I was beaten down by three people in here who all were. We were convinced. I had it. Certified. Well, I I had it at the beginning. I had it at the top, top, but I didn't have it after five minutes because it was was all straight after that. Yeah, after I five, like the only thing that minutes was, in, I, yeah. the only thing that was bugging me a little bit after five minutes in was the fact that we recently played a large clip of Adam or of Artie on the Adam Carolla show, and it wasn't coming up at all. It seemed weird. I, I thought about it, but then I'd also sort of realized uh, two things: a, maybe didn't hear it, and b, maybe he wanted to plug something or something yeah. didn't really feel like going back and tearing the band-aid off that thing and wanted to just kind of move forward so yeah. that crossed my mind the guy's impression was spot on after a few minutes and i had a couple guys in here convinced and telling me that i was wrong i just okay yeah that's i get already. it, it, it it's the not, impression was great the impression's great but it's what everyone does with those impressions is they always start turning them toward jokes and then it becomes an indicator because the real fill in the blank doesn't funnier doesn't work on those doesn't do the jokes right they just tell the stories and he was just telling this story about drugs and the road and howard and stuff so it didn't feel to me yeah you know what it is normally when you're doing an impression you're calling up and you're doing anything you're trying to fool somebody you can't help yourself but to try to push it and get to, like, the next. And when you start pushing it to the co- next yeah, comedy level, tell. then it becomes like, wait a minute. The real Don King wouldn't say that. <laughs> did you did you um, feel the background at all, too? Because then I started hearing the strange noises in the background. I was hearing, so was no, I was hearing things, but to me, it felt like Artie had his TV half you know, at, at uh, volume oh, yeah. seven. And that was like, that's what Artie would have done. Like, as a matter of fact... If I was calling from my house and being this person, I would have my...